about five years ago on Christmas Sunday, and I strolled the streets of South Florida, footloose and felony free. Then it hit the fan. I was a 40-year-old minister, and I had just done my duty. I had on a tie, leisure suit, and some shiny shoes. When I left the pulpit, I wanted to unwind and enjoy my holiday like everyone else. I wanted to make love, not war. I decided to spread a little holiday cheer and go visit my homeless buddy named Freddie, who had camped out in Miami near the downtown railroad tracks. It was a cinch to get there since veterans ride the public transit for free. When I got off the bus and walked around the busty gate, I found him, tipsy as usual, and decided that I might have a little nip as well. It was at this time that things went south. I was confronted by four thugs. I never so much as raised my voice at them, nor did I owe them money, nor were there any women involved. Freddy was in bed with one of the loan sharks, so much so that he sometimes had to give up his food stamp card as collateral. The gang was composed of undesirables. Africa, a loan shark and illegal from Congo, Ice, a thug from Trinidad, Sherman, a petty criminal and con, and some other foreigner who was their leader. Out of the blue, he approached me with his broken English Jamaican accent and said, Leave right now or we're going to punch you, man. Being a veteran of the first round of the Gulf War, I wasn't about to be pushed around by any ingress who shouldn't even be in my country. Showing cowardice was not an option. Though I'm a gentleman and a published poet, I am also heavily muscled, a fairly good boxer and wrestler, and think nothing of multiple attackers for good reason. I have been known for my jaw-breaking power and won't hesitate to body slam a pickpocket. Shockingly, the Lord has blessed me and I've used these same hands to restore a blind woman's sight. But I wasn't in the mood for that nonsense, so I put my hand inside my pocket and on the trigger of my weapon. Then I whispered, go ahead and punch me. Sherman came from the back of the group, made a roundabout sidestep, and did exactly that. Ice got behind me and put his hand behind his back like he had a piece. Over the course of the next three seconds, I wiped the blood off my mouth and drew my old 38 Victoria Arms revolver, you know, the ones with the stubby, expensive bullets, and I pulled the trigger as he began to run down the tracks. For a few seconds, he looked like Carl Lewis. I remembered only one shot, but the cops said I had fired two. I was shocked to learn that a bullet had missed, as I'm an excellent shot. In fact, I aimed for his right arm, and that's exactly what I got. Not only was Sherman bleeding badly, but I had broke his arm, and it now hung like a limp penis. It was high time for me to make my escape, and the goons followed me. Although the Florida has stand-your-ground laws, I did not want to be bothered by Johnny Law. Typically, I carry extra ammo. I also knew if I'd shot all four of them, there was no way I could beat that rap. And even if I wanted to, if I shot and missed, there was a church across the tracks where one of them was on a bike, and if my aim was not true, I would desecrate a church, a major conundrum for a preacher. I went east, and there was a cop car parked nearby. To the west was a bus stop, and as one approached, they all got on it as well, and the driver kicked me off the first bus. Then I failed to flag down a taxi because it had a high rate of speed. By the time another bus had come, the cops were on the scene. Detectives took me into custody and off the second bus and became upset when I politely declined to help them with their investigation, like it was the standing duty of a black man to help persecute himself. Then they ignored all the facts and wrote the report like I antagonized the criminals. Funny thing was, two of my attackers knew I usually carried heat, even on the Sabbath, which means they put their own lives in their idiotic, weed-infused hands. I didn't make bond, but I wasn't worried. I was expecting the case to be dismissed. I went to court twice in 33 days, the extra two days because of the Martin Luther King holiday. It was difficult for me not to smile despite my shackles and enduring one of the worst New Year's on records. If you can't pull a gun on four villains, when can you pull one? I'm never going to buy a concealed weapons permit as long as I have God-given pockets. I won't be pimped. Why should I have to pay for the privilege of carrying around a weapon? What's next, a $150 air and drinking water permit? Where was my permit when they sent me to Iraq? The state took no action, but my church fired me. I had the last laugh, though. As I approached the stage, I got canned, but I took the high road. 
My Bible says no man hath greater love than this, that he would lay down his life for his friends. It says nothing about laying it down for my enemies. I then blessed the congregation and walked away. The next Sunday I heard that only six members of the flock had showed up to the service. The following Sunday he lied and said he had offered me my job back as the assistant pastor, but I was too ashamed to assume my post. I am an ex-sailor. Ashamed of what, exactly? I thought preachers were supposed to tell the truth. I put some hate mail on his windshield that basically told him he should hang up his spurs. My captors were kind enough to lose my lovely lime green suit for me, but the county eventually reimbursed me. It was good that Jesus and Uncle Sam had taught me patience. In other news, my act of mercy and restraint was not appreciated, and I was stalked by the goons I chose not to kill. The pigs in blue and immigration did nothing. They looked at me like I had a crack pipe in my mouth. Those thoughtless white-collared bastards and hags asked me if I could produce the last names, addresses, and social security numbers of the thugs, or if I had any pictures of them harassing me in the act. I dare say I nearly lost my temper. Some Spanish cop actually sighed and screamed at me when I came near, saying that she only had five minutes left on her shift. Since I did not leave my balls in the wheat fields of Kansas where I'm from, I screamed back, I want you to get rid of these damn stalkers. It was then and there that I decided if I ever had to pull my pistol again, I would aim for the head or the heart. Or as my charming Uncle Lonnie of Vietnam fame put it, everybody that came to the party would have got some. The good book advocates mercy to receive mercy, but here I am, devoutly wondering, is it worth the stress and the strain? Especially when you end up in a cell eating horrible bologna sandwich next to an unwashed heathen with fake cheese. If you have an SHTF story that you'd like to share, please email me at reallifeshtf at gmail.com.